Welcome to The Design Board, a podcast created by the team at Upspring that focuses on design, development, and everything in between. We invite innovators in our industry and explore topics that support your growth in every way. The Design Board is a proud member of Surround, a podcast network from Sandow Design Group featuring the architecture and design industry's premier shows. Check it out at surroundpodcast.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Design Board. I'm your host, Caroline Saba, Vice President at Upspring, and I'm joined by three incredible industry professionals passionate about sustainability. Today, we are going to be talking about the rise in commercial to residential conversions, but let's start off with some quick introductions. First, we have Rick Whitney, Vice President at Fitzgerald's, an architecture, planning, and interior design firm headquartered in Chicago. Rick is a leader in the firm's pursuit of senior housing, affordable housing, and hospitality projects, and he champions the belief that the adaptation and rehabilitation of older buildings is a viable course of action to energize the performance of existing projects. I'm also joined by COVA Vice President Dan Sullivan. COVA is a leader in integrated whole project building material solutions, from faucets and flexible interior wall systems to facades. Inspired by his unconventional journey in the A&D industry, Dan has set out to develop material solutions that enhance building performance and longevity. He is passionate about creating building solutions that lead to a healthier built environment. Also with us today is Nick Bober. Nick is the former editor of DesignWell and current web editor of CE Pro, where he covers industry news regarding design and technology and how those can be applied to achieve better occupant health outcomes and a more sustainable construction. Thank you all for being here with me today. I'm so excited to get started. So to kick things off, according to a recent report from the Urban Land Institute and the National Multifamily Housing Council Research Foundation, repurposing commercial properties into multifamily housing is growing more common across various real estate markets and could provide a critical source of housing where there are shortages. I'd love to start things off by hearing your perspective on this emerging trend. I mean, I think it's really great for a variety of reasons. I mean, just to start off kind of coming in on the tail end of the pandemic, it's a conversation that really needs to be had just as a means of discussing what's going to be done with all these abandoned or downsized office spaces. We've kind of gotten past the turbulence that was whether or not everybody is going to be returning to the offices or everybody's going to be working from home. So I think now property owners and everybody involved in that section of the industry is kind of in agreement of what the state of these spaces is going to be. And so for the ones that aren't going to get used up or maybe they're going to be used at reduced capacity, the conversation surrounding what's going to be done with them and all that empty space is great to be having. I guess the other element of that is the fact that it's really far in the future, but it's still nice to be talking about it right now, just as far as like what's going to be done as far as this kind of post building, talking about like post new construction, renovation style economy. I guess a good example of that would be talking about, you know, what's going on in Japan currently, where a lot of their economy and building infrastructure focuses around the constant renewal and rebuilding and repurposing of buildings just because there's not a whole lot over there for as far as new space to build on. And like I said, while in America, that is far off in the future. It's something that's really great to be having the conversation of right now, just simply because people have not really been the best at talking about things super far into the future. I think that's really interesting. And you started to hit on it too, that this has really taken off since the pandemic. So I'd love to dive into that a little bit further. And Dan, I'd love to hear your perspective on how you think the pandemic accelerated this trend. Sure. Yeah. By the way, thanks for for having us all on here. I think this is a great topic to be talking about very timely, especially, you know, now as we kind of walk through our downtowns. I mean, here in San Francisco, there's, you know, real attention paid to the fact that our downtown has essentially died. Um, That people who were in offices previously who contributed to the economies of downtowns have moved their primary workplace to the home and, you know, abandoned these enormous structures that, you know, were once the centers of activity. So as Nick was was alluding to, I don't know whether the pandemic was 
really the instigator of this, but we've been, technology has really kind of reached a point which is enabling us to be able to work from home with, you know, nearly the same uh, effectiveness as uh, we used to have in the office. And, and so we are looking at this, this glut of real estate, but, you know, certainly now, now more than ever, we're, we're confronted with the reality post pandemic of what to do with this glut of real estate in our downtown places. I could add to that. In Chicago, we're sort of seeing kind of what, what Dan's describing, where post-pandemic, it's been quite a hit to downtown Chicago. We certainly saw the rise in empty office space occurring before the pandemic, but it wasn't just the pandemic, I think, that affected us. We, there's new construction happening in downtown adjacent neighborhoods. Fulton Market is one in Chicago. It's just particularly been a uh, a focus of new office development, and that's drawn tenants from the older buildings, the ones that are they're becoming outmoded, drawing them from that center to the neighborhood. So we we had the pandemic hit us, but we also had uh, just uh, some obsolescence of buildings coming as well. I think to kind of add on to that, to not just talking about kind of like the glut of empty real estate that is in these like commercial sections of cities, but just the overabundance of, or I guess like the overgrowth of population in areas of the U.S. where there hadn't really been a high density population in the past. So that movement is not just opening up, you know, a need for repurposing of new spaces in these commercial sections. It's causing these other areas to become overrun with just people who can't really find housing. It's caused the housing markets to go up. And, you know, obviously saying build more homes and the prices of homes will go down is kind of a very simplistic way of looking at the market. But there is demand in those areas now where there wasn't a whole lot before. And again, kind of repurposing those buildings may be more feasible than kind of relying on home building to just kind of fill in the gaps there. Yeah. And and actually to just kind of tag on to, to Nick again there, the pandemic has really changed the kind of real estate that we look for too uh, when we're looking for homes. So, you know, now we're, we're looking for larger spaces with what people are referring to as Zoom rooms, but, you know, places where they can actually accomplish work at home. So it's, it's you know, really kind of forcing people to look for larger homes, which is, you know, kind of changing the, the market demand. Mm-hmm. And that's impacted the design of what we do. We do a lot of multifamily and having more, uh, more well-appointed and more robust work from home spaces has certainly uh, entered into our work. Yeah, this is so interesting. I think there's a lot happening within these sectors too. And I, I love what you all are saying about what's happening across the country as well and what this could mean both for our downtowns and then for the people um, working in those offices or working at home. So Rick, I'd like to get your perspective too on the benefits these conversions bring to the architecture and design community. And like I was saying to that end user, to the community in which they live. Well, for architecture and design, certainly it's it's an opportunity for work. It's something we've been converting commercial buildings in Chicago for, for many years, but it's just in the downtown area, we're starting to see more interest and, and more activity. So on that side, there's just a potential uh, significant amount of work coming along. So we love that. But also saving buildings, it's, it's certainly, it, we see it as a very sustainable thing to do uh, rather than to, to take a building down and having to dispose of it. We see buildings can be reused very effectively for residential. But these buildings also, they're, they're part of the surroundings that they're in. They're part of the neighborhoods and the communities that they're in. And taking them out, replacing them certainly can affect that community as well. So finding that use and reuse and that repurpose and that revitalization of the building, I think is really uh, important for, for communities. These buildings have all kinds of significance. It could be historic, be the significant activity or significant event occurred at this building, artistic, just the design of the building itself, or the cultural and even emotional weight that the building like this carries within community. Yeah, I think that's great. And then to that end too, what about your perspective on the feasibility of these conversions and what strategies or steps would you implement to determine if a commercial property is suitable for a conversion? 
well, when we look at them, I think the, one of the things we look at is the floor plate itself. Narrower floor plates are generally going to work better for a conversion. Uh, looking at office plate buildings in particular, but even, even not office buildings. Larger and deeper floor plates are much harder to convert to residential. You're you're going to yield a less efficient floor plate from that standpoint. We can only use so much of it. We we estimate typically we can use about 50 to 55 feet of depth from the exterior wall at the most for residential use. Anything beyond that, it becomes much more difficult to find a use for that space. So that's something we look at. Another is looking for means of egress in the building, which I mean primarily the stairwells. Buildings that were designed in the uh, late part of the 19th and early part of the 20th. Building codes are so much different. We've walked into plenty of buildings where there was one stairwell served in the building and the remaining vertical egress was by fire escapes, which if you've ever had a chance to take one of those, I wish you well. <laughs> it's, it's exciting to say the least. So if we're a building one stair, we're going to have to put another one in. And so that's really a cost thing that uh, uh, we advise our owners on. Vertical circulation, I mean, elevators, most office buildings of that same vintage were probably over elevator. So we don't tend to use all the elevators that were in there. But the size of the elevators are a challenge. And particularly with the uh, current accessibility and emergency codes, we find ourselves we may have to um, enlarge a, a elevator hoistway to put a compliant elevator. And then finally, um, maybe a smaller thing, but a building on a corner is a much better candidate than a mid-block building because most codes require that residential units be provided with natural light and ventilation. And we get better access to that from a corner building than we do on a mid-block building. Interior property lines, there's often certain setbacks you have to have from those lines to be able to use the windows on those on those elevations. So a, a corner building is a, is a big plus for something like this. So those are some of the things we look at. Okay, great. That's super interesting. It gives an in-depth look too about what that could potentially look like. And then what about vacancy? Is that a requirement for adaptive reuse projects? We certainly don't think so. We've converted partial buildings before. We probably back around 2000, we converted a building right on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. We converted top six floors to residential. The owner's uh, job at that point was to consolidate the, the tenants that were on those floors, find new locations for them in the building, which they certainly had. They were experiencing some vacancy, which drove their decision to make this conversion. So it's certainly, it's, it's easier from a construction standpoint when the building is empty. It's not impossible. For example, this project that I mentioned, we had six floors of residential blood the office. Residential buildings require a lot more plumbing than an office building does. We had a lot of weight stacks coming down. We had to collect and get down through the rest of the building. So that was a little bit more of a challenge, but certainly not impossible. It's one that can be addressed. So a building doesn't have to be entirely empty to get done. Yeah. Okay, great. That leads to another question I had. And Dan, I'd like to get your perspective on this one about if that building is occupied, how do you minimize disruption when you're going to construct that project? Yeah, I love Rick's list of the parameters that, that work for residential, you know, in kind of a, a metric fashion, but, you know, just kind of like peering back into history and which buildings are easy to repurpose versus difficult to repurpose. You know, we have a really easy time reusing. And by the way, sorry, I'm, I'm speaking more toward uh, general repurposing and not specific to residential, but, you know, it's easy to repurpose hangars, train stations, old museums, churches, the old mill buildings. So if you kind of look at those buildings and what makes those reusable, therein you find sort of the rules of thumb that make conversions more feasible, you know, and just to add to Rick's list, things like floor-to-floor -floor heights that can accept a variety of mechanical systems, daylight, access to daylight, good windows. But then also, you know, to pick up on one of Rick's former points, like buildings that actually have character, that contribute to the fabric of the city and actually kind of speak to us in, in an emotional way and make us want to love them and, and continue to, to reuse them. So just kind of adding that, but then jumping to your point about vacancy, 
we have for a long time uh, explored the idea of modular construction. I think it's certainly for those of us who studied architecture, it's been you know an, an obsession since the early 20th century. But we're kind of at a point now where the dream of modular construction is becoming a reality. And a lot of senses, you know, especially when we're talking about interior builds, now there are a lot of products on the market that can enable a floor plate to be built out without hammers, saws, drywall dust, messy, loud construction. And so to the degree that we can leverage those systems for the renovations, they can certainly make occupancy possible during during a build out. That's great. I like what you were saying to Dan about really the psychology of space as well. I think that's really interesting and sort of ties to this conversation about really creating places that people can live in over a long period of time. That's a great point if I could add to that is that uh, that's one thing I think uh, adaptive use projects like this bring is it brings space with character and unique character. No two conversions are alike. No two buildings like this are alike. And each one has its, its own story, its, its own history, and really finding those things in a building's history and, and making that part of a for the new use. That's yeah, I think it's one of the unique opportunities for projects like this. It's something I certainly like. I love doing these projects. Yeah. I think if I could actually add in a personal anecdote to the area I live out by, um, Massachusetts, the entire state is just basically overrun with old mill buildings. And so a lot of the housing options that you have in this area are these old renovated mill buildings. And I can tell at the very least from a city nearby, the city of Lowell, that renovation and restoration of those old mill buildings have played a heavy factor in the city's attempt to kind of bring about a cultural renaissance in there. You know, you have Jack Kerouac calling this place home and they've kind of taken that idea and taken all of these different buildings and use that to build a very thriving artist community out of that. That's great. Yeah. I think this gives like a, a great outlook to the future. It's such a positive one too. For the nitty gritty details like floor plates, window systems, and HVAC, what challenges do we face when working on conversion projects and what are some general strategies to overcome them? Dan and, and other perspectives on this as well. Yeah, I think I think Rick is probably going to be um, more adept at, at handling this, but I think it kind of goes back to the previous question, which is starting with the right building, making sure that that you're not you're unraveling a sweater of of retrofits to to suit your purpose. So you know, I think all of Rick's parameters on floor plate depth and floor to floor height, low toxin sites, et cetera, I think play a role in this. Yeah, I think um, one of the things we see uh, commonalities among the, the stuff that we've done, having the building structure in place is like one of the one of the biggest values to a project like this. It's you know, not only do we have to not put a new structural system and we don't have to do the foundation and therefore the excavation all that comes with that. So that's a that's a huge plus uh, for a project like this. But when we get to the, the building envelope. Inevitably, we have to we have to upgrade the the envelope. Original windows. Uh, we walked into many buildings that had single pane wood or single pane steel windows, which obviously they're just not going to suffice for a for a residential conversion. So, window replacement is almost always necessary. It's a it's a costly endeavor too, but you would have that new construction as well. Another thing is mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. We almost always put in new systems be an old office building or an old a warehouse or industrial building, those systems were obviously never intended to serve a residential population. So we inevitably end up pulling those out and putting in new systems. So there's a cost that's also consistent with new construction. It's something I need to go in and do. But it does give us the opportunity to develop better performing buildings. Working on the envelope, we can make it more thermally efficient. We can make a, a tighter envelope that way when we get to do those things. And, and that will help us. We can more right-size the, the HVAC systems so that they're working in concert with a more thermally efficient envelope. 
and uh, it gives us a chance to use more energy efficient uh, electrical fixtures as well as more resource responsive plumbing systems, i.e. water use. So, uh, so, you know, there's some costs that come with that, but there's some opportunities that come with it as well. And then the things I mentioned about stairs and, uh, and elevators also go into this. They kind of make up some of the largest costs in a project like this. So those are the ones that uh, we make sure that uh, our, our clients understand that as we embark on projects like these. Yeah, that's great. That makes sense that that communication aspect is important. And then, Dan, how does this trend align with the industry's growing interest in design circularity and product reconfigurability? Sure. Well, I I might take those as two different things. Circularity, you know, sort of at its base is really just about being low toxin, low carbon, and low waste. So low toxin really is about the types of materials that you use in in the building low carbon is about you know the embodied energy in in what you put in the building and and low waste you know sort of speaks for itself i mean sustainability at this point is you know is really built into many companies real estate plans it's you know not it's not optional it's uh it's required by them and then even further can be required by by jurisdictions, um, but also creates opportunities for, you know, certifications like LEED or Living Building Challenge, which ultimately can be differentiators for developers who are building spec office buildings, you know, and ease of getting tenants, but also differentiators for people who, for companies who want to tout the virtues of being quote unquote sustainable. So, I mean, there's definitely, it's, it's you know, it's it's an interest in that the industry has in circularity, but I think it's it's more of sort of a social societal movement, and I think it's finally kind of matching up with the business case. So all the stuff that we're talking about in terms of reuse, in terms of its impact on waste, et cetera, is really kind of aligned with with this sea change in the in the construction industry. Your point of sustainability is a great one, Dan, because for three years, obviously, we, we've Sustainability and certification would usually come as a requirement for municipality. But now we've got clients that are coming to us from a corporate standpoint, they've set some pretty rigorous sustainability goals. So they bring that to the projects that that we work with them on. So it truly is a sea change, as you mentioned. We're, we're seeing it change almost daily. We have a sustainability director that works with us. And even the discussion now is this do we need certification systems to do this? Or are we going to see companies uh, that do have their own sustainability goals and their projects are simply going to conform to their company or their corporate or responsibilities and, and goals are? It truly really is a sea change, if you say. I think the uh, other thing that's really important to note with this is just the fact that, you know, kind of talking about just the idea of when you're approaching these types of projects and you're thinking to yourself, how can you overcome some of the limitations? Like say you're going into a commercial space that was never meant to be built for residential use and you're kind of trying to figure out how you can work with all these systems to get it to that residential level. It's really great to be able to have an opportunity to look at that because as these projects become more and more numerous, you have people kind of coming to the idea that, well, if we want to make it easier for ourselves to do these conversions, we should build with adaptability in mind first. And I think having the opportunity to look back, see that, you know, we already have like a lot of buildings in place. And so the amount of new buildings that we're going to need in the future are kind of dwarfed by the number of buildings that we already have. But for those future construction projects, we can start to look at them as, okay, we need to, we're building an office, but somewhere down the line, maybe it'll need to be turned into a MDU. And so we should probably build this with a little bit more reconfigurability in mind this way. And I think that is going to, again, contribute to the idea of circularity in the future. Yeah, Nick, that's such a great point. You know, you look back at our history and we just as human beings are so bad at predicting the future. And so if we just give ourselves the ability to be wrong at 
you know, low cost and low impact to, you know, the environment and, and to budgets, we're really setting ourselves up for success in the future. Yeah, I like that. It's almost like a universal layout for these types of buildings or that sort of perspective moving forward so that they can adapt and be flexible over time. And then Dan and Rick, I'd love to hear your thoughts too on what ways project collaborators come together to ensure that an adaptive reuse project is built to last. Uh, sure. I mean, I really think, you know, Rick, you're, you're kind of boots on the ground. So you are, you know, you're much more in the weeds on this. But I mean, I think starting with the admission, like I just said, that we're, that we're bad at planning for the future and kind of setting off and as part of the basis of design for these buildings that they are future proofed is one way that that actually becomes part of just the the project brief but then i guess you know it really is kind of thinking of the ecosystem of people who participate in a, a building coming about and committing as a group of people to learning from each other through these individual processes to build them into more, you know, rules of thumb or, or best practices that can be adapted by other teams going into projects as well. Yeah, it's a, usually we, we, when it comes to planning for, for something that's, that's, that's going to last, it's going to endure, we try to bring on the team as early as we can. We want all that feedback early on. And that includes general contractors. We want, we want, we want them in as well. A lot of decisions are made early on as to with a building, what what can we reuse versus what do we need to change? And sometimes a client may want to make a do something that is a very first cost beneficial decision that down the road would lead to, to an issue. So we really try to leverage the team to look at those decisions and uh, make sure that uh, what we're doing is going to benefit the building and the owner in the long run. Having the team early on, that's that's one of the things I think that, that we do to help with that. I think another thing is that it helps the decision-making process is to always keep the end user in mind. It's highly likely that most people in the design team may not be living in this residential building when it's done. So we often, you know, often get to see who the end or directly talk to the end users. So, but keeping them in mind and making sure that what we're delivering is going to really provide a quality dwelling, but also one that, that is as future-proofed as we can. Dan, you're absolutely right. It's uh, it's hard to predict the future. I can I've I've been with uh, with Fitzgerald for 33 years, and things that we're seeing now in, in buildings we never imagined when we started, you know, 30 years ago. So it's difficult to see in the future, but really getting that team on board early this brings more perspectives, more insight. And more information to make decisions. Yeah, and actually, just to tack one more thing onto that too, I think the products that we put into the buildings are also really important here. I mean, this goes back to mm-hmm. the to the point about flexibility. Is that you know if we are using systems that are not going to generate waste when we know we need to to move them, I mean that's that's building to last. You know, it's not. It's not about building a concrete wall. It's about building the wall that performs as well as concrete that can be relocated. And, you know, at, at the end of its useful life, disassembled and, and used as a raw material in, in the production of another product. I think that's great. I love both of those perspectives. And then lastly, I'd really like to end on a piece of advice for our listeners. What would you recommend to someone, whether that's an architect, designer, or a product manufacturer that's interested in navigating commercial to residential conversions? Nick, I'd love to start with you on this one. Yeah, so I'll I'll come about it from kind of like, I guess, um, an inspiration standpoint, because I guess at, at the end of the day, I am more trained in the arts than anything else. And I like to view design and architecture as an art because just look at any pro- any architectural project, they're beautiful most of the time. But anyways, getting back to the point, just being able to keep abreast of what's going on in the industry, kind of um, looking into industry publications. A lot of the design and architectural publications, they'll do this fantastic job of showcasing all of these different projects that are taking place within the industry. 
And as much as I want to stress the importance of understanding the basics to get yourself started, you know, kind of reading over that, best practices, all those sorts of things, just all of the best laid plans, you know, can't survive first contact on a project most of the time. And so being able to view these projects that other architects or designers are completing in the world and how they're approaching these projects is really vital for people. It's a great way of trying to get a feel for how this stuff might look in the real world. That's great. Rick, what about you? I think uh, kind of going back to one of the points that I, I said earlier, projects like this, um, existing buildings, uh, they come with stories. They're not coming in as newcomers. So really understanding the building, understanding its history and learning the stories of, about that building and being able to tell it again in, in its new use. I think for us, and we've done many conversions, that's one of the I think success factors we've seen projects like that is that story it uh, it communicates to to the owner it communicates to the end user and it communicates to the community and it's something to find that story and um, and make a part of what you do. I love that, Dan. What about you? Yeah, Rick, I love that too. I think I mean I love you know kind of situating just the the humanness really at the center of this the human story. I would also say that, you know, again, when, when we talk about a commercial to residential conversion, we're probably not talking about the last time that building is going to be converted. You know, there's a future moment where we have a need that we haven't foreseen and potentially those residential units are converted to something else. So I, th I think maybe we think about buildings as experiments, you know, experiments for better living, for being better humans. And to work as an industry to, you know, sort of close that gap between how quickly we evolve as a human and how quickly buildings evolve, which are, you know, currently at two vastly different speeds. And invest in building as things, as commercial and cultural assets that gain value every time they're, that they're adapted. So, um, so that, that so the value and adaptation actually becomes part of our core principles. That's great. I like that perspective too of the importance of the human in that space and then how that ties back to the way we're building. Amazing. This has been such a great conversation. Thank you all again for joining and contributing. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Yeah, no, it was it was a wonderful time talking. Yes. Thank you, Caroline. It's great. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening in with us today. We hope you leave inspired by the ideas in today's episode. For more, follow Upspring on LinkedIn and Instagram, and don't forget to check out the amazing lineup of shows brought to you by the Surround Podcast Network at surroundpodcast.com.